My name is Martin Brinskov. I'm the uh, moderator and chair of this session. Um, the e-government digitalization of public services, uh, Policy Lab 1. So please ensure that you're in the right room, that you actually want to talk about and discuss. Uh, also online, the digitalization of e-government and public services. Otherwise, go to the other rooms. Um, so um, before I invite our speakers uh, on the stage, I would maybe we could get the Slido up just to uh, have the practicalities here. Um, because also online, we need to ensure that you are in the right room. Can you see in the top right corner, it says Policy Lab 1. So on your screen, it should also say Policy Lab 1, e-government and something because otherwise you will be commenting on the other rooms, and that would be quite confusing, wouldn't it? Um, and we will use the Slido also in this session. So um, welcome uh, very much. I will uh, start by inviting our uh, panelists and uh, discussants in this session on to the stage. And in a good virtual fashion, we will start by bringing a face on a screen, Jean-Francois, uh, Junger, the Deputy Head of Unit for the uh, Public Services from European Commission. Very welcome, sir, uh, here in the room. Can you hear us? I guess that's a no. <laughs> okay, so while, while technicalities are being looked into, I will bring the bodies on stage here. First one being uh, Matthew Kane, Head of Digital London Borough Hackney. Welcome on stage. Um, Matthew has been uh, with the borough Hackney for a year, more or less, now, and uh, um, is doing it on the ground, so looking very much forward to having your perspective on this. Uh, Kitty, Kubo, welcome. Um, the uh, Innovation Manager for the uh, uh, Health Cluster uh, here in Tallinn, the Science Park. Um, also, I can hear you loud. Okay, okay, very good. We are happy to have you here. Um, we, will, we will return uh, to, the, to the virtual faces again. Thank you. Um, so, Innovation Manager, and also in your research, you have been looking into how to actually organize uh, innovation uh, in this uh, domain. Very welcome uh, to you. Uh, we have David Hope of Coventry and Warwickshire, the Innovation Program Manager. So, again, but uh, from a uh, local government perspective. Uh, welcome, sir. Very happy to have you here. And we have a well-known <coughs> face, Laurent Friedres um, from uh, Espan. And uh, thank you also for joining us in this session. So, Jean-Francois, back to you. Can you hear us? Can you see us? Okay. Can he speak? All right. So we will come back to the question of voice in the uh, digital era. Do we, do we have a, an estimate on, on whether, whether Jean-François will be able to join the session? OK. It's very impolite, I think, to start with our <coughs> all, all hands uh, on. But Jean-François, as, as soon as you can, uh, please let us know uh, th that you are here, that you can hear us. Um, and perhaps the team could also give us uh, Give us a short note. So we are going to. I can to hear you and I can see you. Oh, fantastic! Fantastic! Welcome. Let's give let's give technology a hand. Uh, Jean Francois, very happy to have you here, and you can still hear us. Can you still see us? Yeah, fantastic. You either either it's the online connection or it's the PowerPoint that you cannot uh, get to work. I think we will, we will slowly, slowly uh, get started. Jean-François can hear us, but there is a lack, there is a delay in the connection. Okay, a profound lag, right? Like in 10, 20 minutes, seconds. Okay, Jean-François, we will try to manage, and uh, I let the team uh, optimize as we go along. Very welcome here uh, in the panel. So, um, before I uh, give you the floor and uh, introduce yourselves, um, maybe you can have a think about how we can make this session um, focusing on the topics that are most relevant to you here in the audience 
And I certainly invite you to, let's say, highlight and bring to the forefront what you find most challenging, most interesting, most timely to discuss. So we heard in the opening uh, plenary uh, from the overview from, <coughs> from uh, Paul and from uh, Laurent, there's plenty of work uh, to be done. But let's focus a little bit on then how does government, how do the public services then actually get uh, digitalized. This is not a trivial um, move. It is, of course, about efficiency. Yes, we know digital services can be more efficient. But increasingly, it's actually touching on the very nature of government. So before, you could take the streets and throw the guys out if you weren't happy. Now, where is the switch? Where is the button? Where do you live when you are also online and everywhere? And as someone mentioned this morning, in your bed. So how do you even interface? How do you even interact? How do you even conceive what is government in this day and age? So there, we, we have fundamental questions about what is e-government. Now, another thing is that is the power even switching? So we have big global players entering. Much of our time spent on the mobile devices is not interacting with your local government as you were walking down the street. It's interacting with online services coming out of the US mainly. So there's a real shift in your, let's say, the actual interface to these services. So, of course, how does the public react to that? How do the stakeholders around government react to that? But also, how does government react to that? And how should, if we can be normative about this, how should government react to that? Then we can, of course, look at the different sectors, see where uh, the different uh, uh, levels of maturity, we could say, or transformation, uh, uh, how they are progressing. We can also have the territorial <coughs> perspective and have a discussion about, OK, is it exactly the same template we should use? Or are there actually individual differences, even uh, if we look at the different levels of government? There's plenty to discuss. But um, I think um, we will start with a short introduction by the panelists. And while you um, uh, introduce yourselves, we should um, have you give your say about what do you think is the most urgent topics to discuss. And for that, we will uh, use the Slido as well. And I think um, maybe we can uh, put it up and show it to you. And then while the panelists, the discussants, they introduce themselves, you take your choices. And then we use that as a reflection for the rest. So maybe we can put up the Slido here now. It's a bit of lag. Very good. So about the digital transformation public institution, which topics would you like to be further discussed? And we have the citizen engagement and participation. Now, this is only not just bear in mind. This is also about you know, the relationship between uh, the public and the services. Um, all the opportunities, as well as the challenges, I'm certain we can put all security and privacy in there. The leadership strategy, uh, if you want to know more about the organizational, the strategic moves that can be made, we can discuss those. Skills, reskilling, attracting talent, funding, both your own funding, if you have some, and also what instruments are available. There's a host of instruments that we could discuss, and I'm sure that the colleagues here on stage have uh, very practical knowledge about. There's the whole partnership dimension, and then there's, of course, economic development locally, meaning jobs. So please ensure that you are in Policy Lab 1 when you do your polling, so you can see this. And then um, uh, let us know what you think we should focus on. OK, but um, back to the uh, speakers. And I will give you uh, three to five minutes to introduce yourselves and uh, your initial thoughts on being here. Um, we should see, Jean-Francois, if you are, in fact, um, Ready with us? If, if not immediately, I would say um, we take you uh, as the last presenter. So by that, the internet should have caught up with the speech here. OK. So Matthew, first, 
Um, what are the, what are the, could you introduce yourself and, and you know, give a few pointers to the audience on what do you feel is most pressing when we discuss digitalization? Why is it not just trivial and just do your job and do it? Right, so firstly, what a privilege it is to be able to talk about digitalization in, in Tallinn, in Estonia, the heart of e-government. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, I am feeling nervous, impatient, and slightly pessimistic all for a Thursday morning. Um, why? Because government is a legacy organization. And legacy organizations haven't just struggled to adapt to digitalization. Mostly, they failed. <coughs> Blockbuster, retail outlets, mostly th th they, they haven't succeeded in rising to this challenge. And I don't feel sufficient impetus um, it, 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 um, and progress has been made um, g given where we are today. There are three key, key things, I think, that, that are on my mind. The first is that digitalization in and of itself does not make anything better. I joined an organization in Hackney Council. I previously worked in a more rural area called Buckinghamshire, um, slightly out of, outside of London. Both organizations have put a lot of things online and done it very badly. They've taken paper forms and they put them on the internet. The service is still rubbish. So digitalization in and of itself does not make anything better. What I'm really interested in is whole scale change, which rethinks the business model, the value proposition, as well as the way that citizens interact with us. The second thing, therefore, is that the approach of our national government, which I'm sure is completely correct, but the approach of our government digital service was to digitize the highest volume transactional services. Seemed the smart thing to do. Probably was in, in a central government context. But in local government, where we deliver services to citizens, actually some of the services that are most in need of um, rethinking for a digital era aren't those used by most citizens, where actually early phase um, introduction of computers has reduced the cost per unit of providing those services. It's those services which are relatively low volume, but where the cost is high. Looking after children, for example. Um, t uh, transporting elderly people uh, <coughs> to hospital. Um, th there are lots of services which we provide in an, um, in an era built for Queen Victoria, uh, and we're still providing them in much the same way in, in, in 2017. Th the third thing, therefore, is that the challenge around digitization is not a technocratic one. It's about adaptive change. And there are political choices involved in that. I fear that we have siloed our thinking, certainly in a UK, in a UK context. We have made this about the delivery of public services. We haven't made it about democracy. We haven't made it about citizen engagement. We've just made it about um, the digitization of public services. And we've suggested there are no political choices. You can have better services, yay! Lower cost, yay! What politician couldn't support better services at lower cost? Yet fundamentally, that's approaching it with the wrong set of strategies and tactics. This is about adaptive change, not technocratic change, and so requires a different approach. It's quite skeptical for, for, a, for a Wednesday morning. It, it, it is, but I'm also excited, because I think the scale of the potential to do differently is so great, and the opportunity for resetting the way that government is organized around citizens' needs is so profound that what we could achieve is genuinely transformative. It's just we haven't even begun to run that race. So let's keep that note. We haven't even begun. I think that's, that's a fairly, uh, let's say, interesting start. It's not like the future is already here and we have done a lot of stuff. Actually, some of the profound challenges is what I'm hearing have not even been uh, addressed yet. So I speak only as a citizen of the United Kingdom and someone who paid four parking fines for speeding in France on my summer holiday. So I, so I have very little knowledge um, beyond the United Kingdom, I hasten to add. Well, I can reflect then, representing uh, more than 100 cities around the world, it's universal, <laughs> I would say. Very good. Kitty, let's uh, jump to you. Um, you come from a sectoral perspective mainly, but I think addressing the same dynamics. So um, may you just introduce yourself and give your view 
on this digital transformation of one of the key public services in the healthcare domain. But you feel free to generalize. Yeah, thank you. Um, the reason I was probably invited here was the fact that uh, I'm part of the uh, Technopolis Group team, who is just uh, kicking off a new study uh, commissioned by EPSA. And it's about the uh, future of digital health in EU. And um, the kickoff meeting will be next week, but um, uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to implement this study and the kind of a objective or, or, or methodology of the study is that we are going uh, uh, to have a comprehensive look into, into four uh, regions, uh, which is in Estonia, Slovenia, uh, Oulu in Finland, and Sofia in Bulgaria. And we kind of uh, try to understand uh, what makes uh, the digital health uh, in those countries to um, to, to, to be developed and also try to, based on those uh, cases, uh, try to draw some conclusions to the EU uh, e-health digitalization uh, topic. Uh, so that's probably why I'm here. The second reason might be that uh, as Estonia is regarded uh, to be uh, quite, uh, quite uh, well kind of uh, developed in terms of digital society and digital services, then uh, healthcare is, of course, uh, part of, uh, of this uh, digital society, and that's the area I'm day-to-day uh, -day working here in Estonia. Uh, we have uh, formed a uh, cluster, connected health cluster here, and I can really say that if you are dealing in healthcare digital innovation in Estonia, uh, then you are most probably a member or part of the cluster. So our coverage here is, is, uh, is really quite good. Um, about the uh, healthcare um, issues, then healthcare is probably the worst sector to innovate. If you kind of list uh, different factors you need for uh, innovation, then uh, you lack all of them almost in, in healthcare. So it's really uh, challenging and also reading the policy brief you have prepared for this event, you also mentioned this, that it's not going uh, so easy in, in all and every sector. Uh, I also do agree with Matthew that uh, digitalization itself is not or can't be the, the, the aim, meaning that uh, uh, if we look, for example, in healthcare, uh, there are quite a lot of bad processes and uh, you should actually go and redesign the processes with the help of, of digital, different digital tools uh, and not to top up the existing inefficient system by digital services and that's really challenging uh, to uh, change or to catalyze the change in healthcare system using digital tools and if we look at the healthcare system then the challenges are huge and, and really the kind of a mindset should be uh, changed towards more kind of a preventive uh, <coughs> patient-centered and, and integrated care and uh, you talk here about citizens in uh, healthcare we still talk uh, about patients and, uh, and um, this is also the kind of a change in the mindset we, we probably have to go through. So, so uh, just a quick reflection. So do you think that healthcare should be looking into, you know, uh, e-government in general for inspiration? Or do you think that e-government could learn some things from healthcare? Or do you think it has to be integrated? Which is, of course, the answer I don't hope for, because then it is cross-sectoral innovation, and that's even more difficult, perhaps, than uh, solving real issues. So what do you think? What is the relationship between the sector and the more, like, broad... Uh, perspective. I think that the health is part of the governance because uh, in the health sector, I think the most things could be done at national or regional level, mainly, and that's the reason why you can do a lot centrally, but 
but uh, you can also uh, benefit of building good uh, public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. like the cluster I'm representing here. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. We can also come back to that because there are territorial differences. Yeah. So in in uh, in Denmark, for instance, uh, much of the primary health care is the local municipality, which is actually uh, responsible for this, where yeah. in much other yeah. re regions it's a regional uh, or even national uh, mandate to do yeah, this. Yeah, systems differ, differ a lot in this. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, very good. So, David, let's jump to another spot on the British Isles and uh, hear from your perspective. What, what can you, let's say, well, d tell us a little bit about yourself, but also how, what, how can you, you add to what we have heard now from, from your uh, perspective? Yes, Martin. Um, so I'm approaching um, this session very much from the standpoint of industrial strategy and economic development in the region I represent in central England. Um, very different to Matthew's region, although we have England's ninth largest city within our region, we have the county of Warwickshire, which contains a vast rural area and a lot of small towns. Um, also, from an SBOM point of view, I'm lead stakeholder for the RESI project around regional strategies, so that, that's further angle I'm going to come to this. Um, in my introductory points, um, I've thought about the three objectives of the session and um, just um, give some introduction as to um, what's happening in, in the Coventry and Warwickshire region. Um, so the, the first point is... Um, Really, access to high-speed internet is increasingly now being described um, as the UK's fourth utility, and um, very much the digital infrastructure being a key enabler of economic growth. In Coventry, we have a digital strategy to drive economic growth and public sector reform. More widely in my region, um, the West Midlands Combined Authority is setting up a digital board to, over, to oversee now the development of digital infrastructure on a regional level. Now... One of the challenges, um, this may surprise some people, 92% um, of country business premises have access to superfast broadband. So some 8% still do not have access to superfast broadband. So what are our priorities? Very strong emphasis on expansion of fibre broadband and the 5G mo mobile network now um, as an enabler of smart growth, amongst other things, particularly the development of Industry 4.0. Coventry Council, we're currently in a partnership agreement with a broadband provider to try and acquire, upgrade and expand our fibre network. Um, we're also a pilot region nationally um, to deliver a VAT scheme to connect um, SMEs in Coventry and Warwickshire to um, one gigabit capable broadband, another key enabler of, um, you know, we, we see above all access to fast and reliable broadband being a crucial enabler for enhancing um, the international competitiveness of our local businesses. But we're, it's also about combining agendas. So, you know, other key services that are currently being digitalised in the transport sector, looking at um, digital intelligent road signs to support the flow of traffic. From a tourism standpoint, wayfinding points to uh, assist tourists to navigate around our <coughs> region. Um, also the development of digital apps for similar purposes. Um, using, using the digital infrastructure to pilot and test um, connected and autonomous vehicles locally. Planning perspective, developing a portal to show planning developments, that's not just vital to inform the public, but it's also vital to try and um, maximise social economic impacts of new development, local people accessing jobs, local businesses accessing procurement opportunities. From a training point of view, um, digital tools to help upgrade our skills levels, health point of view, using customer records. Nationally, from a business support standpoint, um, a lot of business support is being delivered through the Businesses um, Great Britain website. So, um, you know, some of the key considerations, um, as we touched on earlier, you know, sensitivities around data <coughs> ownership are vital. A lot of services are not from scratch. They're developed from existing services. What is driving it? Our authority has a very active transformation team, which is driven by the head of ICT, and our chief executive, however, one barrier to take up his skills. 21% of UK adults, for example, lack basic digital skills. So it is a, cha it is a challenge um, to, to actually get take up. And the way we're approaching it is the public sector has a key role to pump prime digital infrastructure improvements. However, it is about in, you know, very much stimulating subsequent private sector investment and, and the growth of you know, digital infrastructure. So... From the point of view of how effective it is, well, the Coventry Digital Strategy is a five-year plan. We're very early into it. Mm -hmm. It's um, 
it's very difficult to evaluate the success. However, one of the questions was, you know, what could be useful at an EU level? And I think it's important um, to evaluate the successes and shortcomings of digital services. One example could be in business support services. Support <coughs> services to SMEs are increasingly becoming digitalised in the UK. I suspect that might be the case across the EU. And, and it's very much about, I, I think, you know, understanding, well, what's the optimum balance between face-to-face -face and digital interaction? And what is, what is the true return on, on public sector investment? And how can we better mm. um, use the digital infrastructure to then, you know, generate the growth of our key sectors and stimulate further private sector investment? Very good. So, so you really point to these different layers almost physically. So we need to plow down super fast broadband. That's a given. We need the wireless there. That's a given. So when that's done, then you have to, to find some services. And it's never just copy-paste. You have to somehow integrate. And then there's this the question you touch upon, the ecosystem. You talk about SMEs. And I mean, so it's probably not just done with a website. And you can go into you know, a help desk, or you can go online. But there's also how do you maintain you know, the stakeholder landscape around these? How do you connect them locally, nationally, globally, and so on? So lots of layers there. And the question is then, of course, how do you address well, preferably all of them at once <laughs> yeah. with, with the support from, from the national and, and uh, international level? Okay, we, we will definitely come back to this because I think you know, the instruments that are available to support that, that kind of, of integrated transformation or the strategies uh, would be very interesting to discuss uh, because that's very action-oriented. All right, so... Um, Jean-Francois, do you hear us with lag or without lag? <coughs> do we see you? Should we use Skype? <laughs> Pull out the mobile and FaceTime. Ask Silicon Valley for help. No, I'm just kidding. <coughs> but, but I mean, this, this is in fact one of the, uh, the, the, the paradoxes, right? The convenience of these big services that you can just use, that you are using every day. And then when you have to infrastructure for big things like, you know, government services for, for the things that are in our constitutions and in our, uh, you know, local regulations, uh, how, do we, how much effort do we want to establish that again in the digital and how much can we just use off the shelf uh, from, from, you know, commercial services? It's a very, very, very relevant, I think, Reflection point here. Laurent, um, maybe you could um, give us again uh, your perspective, now focusing on uh, the uh, digitalization of services. And we've heard, I think, I reflections. I do hear you. Oh, fantastic. Do you hear? What, what, what is the time <laughs> where you are? <laughs> what is the lag? We need, I mean, this is, this is like spa speaking to the International Space Station. We need, uh, you know, standards for synchronizing. So if I hold up a clock, I can tell. Uh, the newspaper of the day, are we on the same day? <coughs> I, will, I will have uh, um, Laurent introduce himself and give a perspective here, then come back to you, uh, Jean-Francois. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Laurent, um, so we heard clearly reflections here from also the policy uh, points that you mentioned, this nice overview of policy recommendations on the different levels of government. So, um, I mean, maybe you could also here introduce, I mean, your <coughs> professional uh, background because you, you, you also have a, a professional perspective on, on this uh, coming in. I mean, like we had the healthcare innovation, you have a, a particular, let's say, sensitivization uh, to so this. It's and how do you I'm see sorry, this? I think there is a delay of something like 30 to 40 seconds. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So, in 30 seconds, when I say this, you start speaking. Okay, introduce yourself uh, and your background. So the only way for me will so be to start speaking and not to stop. That is another way, yes. But when you hear the cue, okay. you just start. Okay. <clears throat> we, I, actually, I think, Laurent, if you do the short version, and we anticipate you know, uh, Jean-Francois starting to speak in 20 seconds. So, <laughs> very good. So, if, if Jean-Francois, if, if, if he jumps in, uh, if you can hear yes. me 40 seconds down the line, then uh, uh, very good. So, uh, th thanks very much. Um, I, I'm perhaps not as, as pessimistic as, uh, as Matthew here. I think uh, 
a lot uh, has been done. I think we are starting to, to move, but a lot still has to be done. I think the, the public sector, uh, public institutions are still lagging behind in the digital transition. But that's also because the speed of change has just increased. I think innovation is moving uh, faster and faster. Solutions are piloted uh, and then rolled out much quicker um, than it was done uh, previously. So the life cycles in the way of innovations have, uh, have become shorter and shorter. Um, also, as, I think as, as citizens and as digital citizens, our, our expectations are kind of ha have risen in terms of what we can expect from interacting uh, with, uh, with, other, with our friends, with our colleagues, but also with, uh, with businesses and, 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 and with governments. So we can order uh, books online and they appear tomorrow. Um, so there's a certain immediacy, I think, to, uh, to using digital services that we're quite familiar with on a personal and professional level uh, that is not always reflected, I think, in terms of how we interact with, uh, with government. So um, this digital transformation is really leading to a more kind of user-centric uh, approach. It allows uh, direct communication uh, with, with individuals, uh, with citizens, um, and it allows kind of the tailoring of services uh, to, to individual um, citizens. So I think the challenge for the public sector is that this really impacts all service areas. So it's not just um, something, mobility, where you have a new, a new mode of transport, you have a new technology for, for, for buses so that you roll out, that has an impact on your transport, um, transport policy, but it impacts all service areas, from education to healthcare to mobility. Um, and, uh, and one of the challenges is that, of course, there are a lot of uh, legacy systems in, in the public uh, sector. I think Matthew mentioned that, uh, that in the beginning. So, um, whereas progress has been made, um, there's still a lot to, to do, and there's kind of this constant game of, 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 game of catch up. So, what we've done really at Aspon is to try to, to take a snapshot uh, over the summer uh, of where we stand. Uh, different cities across Europe, we conducted a survey to, to try to understand what is the state of <coughs> digital transition of different services. And what we would l wanted to understand is to see uh, whether, let's say, smaller cities are, are digitalizing at a different rate compared to larger cities, and also whether there are differences between, between different uh, parts of Europe. Uh, we've heard previously that um, the way uh, different services are digitalized varies from one country to another. So in terms of healthcare, for example, in, in, one, in, in some countries this is more centralized than, than, than in others. So there is, there is some uh, potential unevenness across, uh, you know, from a territorial perspective that I think it's important to be aware of. And I think the message is not that every small town and, 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 and small city needs to digitalize all its services, but it needs to understand uh, which services it should focus on as a, as a priority, because some services might be provided at, um, at different, diff different levels. So, in a way, it's really a, a paradigm shift in terms of how, um, how cities and also regional and national governments um, engage with their citizens, how they deliver services. Um, it raises all sorts of questions in terms of, of course, trust and, and familiarity, um, security issues and so on. So, I think there are many, many challenges. Um, but it's very important for us that, uh, that this sense of urgency, I think, is, is, is there, I think, at all levels of, uh, of governments, and that there's a, there's a coordinated approach to, to proceeding in this digital transition. So it is not about going it alone as a, as, as a local borough or a local city, but trying to understand where do you position yourself within your, your local, uh, local ecosystem, within the national ecosystem, and even within the global ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, so one of the issues that you're raising is that, that the, the timelines are different. So while technology changes very fast and imposes expectations uh, to service delivery, then at the same time, well, organizations change very slowly. I mean, we may even talk generations. If you, t you, know, uh, if, if you are heading a ministry, like the permanent secretary or something, I mean, what, what took you there is probably not going to you know, be something that you want to completely disrupt. Because there's also a whole, I mean, there's a whole, let's say, culture around governance and being a public servant. So we, and, and this goes, I'm quite sure, for all levels of government. So the organization, and this reflects back to what we heard from the healthcare sector, the organization perspective actually becomes a key element in uh, managing this uh, innovation. Okay, very good. We have some... Um, well, lots of topic, uh, topics to, 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 uh, to touch upon, but let's return to, I mean, Jean-Francois, if you can, break in. We will give you the floor. 
Um, and, and please, if the colleagues could, could advise uh, what to do, but if you hear us, if you're out there, please join the conversation. Um, so Jean-Francois has been instrumental in setting up some of the instruments around uh, competi uh, competitiveness, uh, some of the more accessible uh, project um, uh, creation instruments, so funding some of these um, uh, uh, collaboration partnerships around uh, actually bringing different stakeholders together for years, and now is working as deputy head of unit in the uh, e-government uh, uh, unit in the European Commission. So it would be fantastic to hear uh, the views there. But let's return to the uh, uh, poll. Can we have the uh, results, perhaps? Right, okay. <clears throat> this, is, this is not really surprising. So citizen engagement participation is key. And I think in this political climate in the world, every elected politician can subscribe. And I think the uh, governments that are trying to then deliver on this, mm. uh, let's say, the connect um, between public services and... I see the live public. video and not the... But I have the sound with a huge delay and you clearly also hear me with a big delay. Uh, if you give me a thumbs up when I can start and I will start. Okay, then I will start now because this I see it. But the sound is... Very delayed compared to what I can see. So, okay. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, sorry, everybody, for this uh, little technical hiccups, uh, and uh, that's the the defect of trying to do it remotely. And we see indeed the limitation of the ICT technology and teleworking and all kinds of uh, issues. Uh, still, if you're on the Commission has published in 2013 the action plan that is calling for an acceleration of the transformation of the public sector. But today we have, for all public authorities, uh, whether national, regional or local authorities, we have a huge window of opportunity because of what has happened earlier this year. In September, end of September, we have the digital summit where the member states have at the heads of state level, call on the modernization of public administrations. This was followed by the ministerial conference in Tallinn, uh, where the member states signed an agreement, uh, a, a declaration calling also for the public sector transformation with a series of priority, with a series of uh, principle applied for the user centricity. And then at the end, we had the Council conclusion end of uh, mid of October, that means a few weeks ago, where again, member states have reiterated back to the Commission the importance of the public, public sector transformation, public sector modernization. So what does this mean? So I can explain very roughly and very quickly what the action plan was about. And you will see and understand, and I think, because I was listening to your, uh, all your presentation earlier, even though with the delay. Um, and you will see how much indeed what you're doing and what we are preaching and pushing uh, goes along the same line. What we want is that we break the silos between the different actors, whether different sectors or whether different political level, regional, local, or national level. Why do we want that? It's because you will see a dramatic efficiency gain. You will see a sharing of resources, sharing of knowledge that enables the delivery of far better, far more efficient, and far more user-minded services in order to make sure we deliver what the citizens want. The Italian declaration goes exactly along the same line, and in particular, it has this user centricity uh, principle that are enshrined in the declaration in the annex, where it is calling for interaction to be done digitally, where services need to be uh, accessible, secured, where we need to work in order to reduce administrative burden. I will not go through the entire list because uh, we, I think we have wasted enough time uh, with this technical issue. Um, now, what will the Commission do out of this? We will start now measuring. So we've had the benchmarking that has been published recently. It's done at the national level. <coughs> where we are me measuring the user centricity of the, uh, the services. We are measuring the transparency of the administration and in, in particular the capacity of reusing information, meaning reducing the administrative burden. 
And we also measure a series of services specifically for businesses and citizens. So what are the main drivers we have today and what is the Commission indeed working, uh, delivering? So the first one, hopefully many of you know, are the different services and what we are doing inside the Connecting Europe Facility Programme, where we are offering to authorities services that will enable your local or regional services to become immediately interoperable and work cross-border whether it is for EID, e-delivery, uh, e-signature, e-invoicing, machine translation. So that's, those are the different elements we are offering today. And there will be more coming in the, this year, uh, like e-archiving. Politically, what is coming in the, in the near future is the introduction of the once only principle. Uh, in the single digital gateway regulation that was presented by the Commission earlier this year, it is still under negotiation, but under Article 12, we introduced the notion of the once only and how the once only could apply. This will mean that administration at all levels will have the capacity to retrieve the information from the other administrations when a citizen agrees for this transfer. So it is not done automatically, it is on the request of the citizens. But this will fundamentally transform how administrations are working today, because they will have to work together, they will have to be in a position to share the information in order to facilitate the life of citizens and businesses. And this is why, again, we go back to the <coughs> centricity. What we also see, and this was announced with the, uh, the action plan in May last year, uh, we see more and more what we call uh, so atomic software or basic services, a modularity that is appearing, where instead of providing big, massive service, you have a series of small services, like the one we're doing, for instance, under the CEF. And those ones can be reused like Lego block and be recomposed in order to deliver much better services. What it means, it means that administration relies on the others, start to reuse and start to uh, share common infrastructure, common cloud infrastructure, if we want to use that word. And the trend is to go towards a government as a platform. But when we talk about this government as a platform, it has to be seen for the different level. It can be a regional uh, platform that enables the municipality it's particular the small municipalities certainly have access to sophisticated services. So it's a fundamental change we see. We're trying to push for the uh, for this transformation uh, and to get much more out of uh, the resources and I would say still the scare resources administrations have. Just to cut it short, because I see that you're trying to push me to go a little bit fast. <laughs> if we look at what is coming uh, in the future, we see, so first of all, we have activity in the research program, but what we see is this transformation will transform also fundamentally the role of the public administrations. Mm -hmm. Like it is happening today in the private sector, the public sector will be faced with the same issue. I would push the two extreme to talk about the relevance of the pu public sector, because if you have intermediary delivering the services, all of a sudden, you start to, citizens might wonder why they're paying taxes because they don't interact with the administration, they interact with the private actor. And for that, we have just launched a study, and I really call you on following that study and participate in that study on understanding what will be the future of the government beyond 2030, when the whole transformation has happened and where services start to be delivered by all kinds of actors. I think I will stop here. I will still listen to you, but clearly I can see you live, but I cannot hear you live. I have a 30, 40 seconds delay. And so uh, just to let you know. So if you want to interact with me, shake your hands so I know that 30 seconds later I can start talking. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this uh, very relevant intervention. Um, so let's say I will wave at you because I think this will happen in more or less real time uh, and then you speak. 
okay, so so we we, we take. I, I think now we have clearly, you know, the efficiency perspective, the optimization <coughs> perspective, versus what we saw here in the top uh, uh, question uh, or the, the top topic, the engagement, the perceived usefulness of this, let's say, optimization <coughs> exercise. And I think it's relevant to discuss how these two uh, come together. So for instance, if I may reflect on what we heard from the commission side, okay, um, so digital Lego blocks, fantastic. I did my PhD together with Lego, looking into how the mobile is changing the world, love it. The question is, if this is going to transform public government in, say, five years, who is going to govern the formation of these Lego blocks? We have discussed the role of the global, of the US, of China, of, of you know, the global south. OK, so can Europe just come and say, this is what we believe? Use it. Or will we just make a bubble in Europe? This is a real, I think, discussion to be had. Who will govern these fundamental mechanisms of connecting? This is a very good question. Of course, we have standardizations, organizations, but that's a mess in and of itself. So I think we should come back to the governance of these mechanisms of interoperability. Uh, and then, of course, the question. We heard limited resources being mentioned. I think that's a, a dominating uh, fact in public sector. OK, so we should innovate. Right. But who funds it? I mean, do you take it from you know, the primary care? Do you take it from, wh where, where does that come from? Does the commission uh, intend that just to come out uh, from, from the uh, various uh, instruments or how? So I think that's also a very fundamental question if you go back to um, uh, the questions we have here. So I would say the, the, the top three, so how do we connect the, the bureaucratic, the technocratic, view from above with the perceived, how do we then transform that into innovations and transformation strategies, and how do we fund it? Let's focus on that for the remainder of the time we have here. Maybe um, a, a few concrete questions. Did we also have uh, uh, some questions that, that have been coming in uh, from here? Um, yeah, OK. What is really needed to shift to post-technocratic adaptive change? Who should take the lead? What skills? Money partnerships. That's basically summing up what I just said. Sorry, I did it so verbosely. Um, but I think we should uh, we should return uh, now to our panelists and really uh, take these uh, three elements at a time. So, how do we <clears throat> how do we in a way? Government is bureaucratic by design. It's meant to be. It's meant to be transparent. It's meant to be um, you know uh, accountable and so on. So how do, you, how, do, how do you keep the balance when you move forward? Because we, I mean, we can go with Singularity uni University and just disrupt. Fantastic. But then where goes the, the accountability? Where goes the transparency? Where goes the, the connection? So maybe you could, you could comment. Well, so, so, so it's a really interesting idea that you conflated um, bureaucracy with uh, accountability and openness. <laughs> because so much of the bureaucratic elements of government defeat the transparent and accountable oh, really? elements of government. Right? Well, that's the rationale for having a bu bureaucracy, isn't it? That's so to be accountable and not just doing things right. you know, with your friends. So, so, so if you, you want to talk about citizen engagement and participation, so here's my pitch, right? So, so, so if you imagine um, government and democracy as, as an hourglass, so we start off with debates, that then produces us votes, which forms us government, which create laws, which then spit out regulations and then services, right? So some, from kind of democracy through to, through to services. Law is basically code, isn't it? In this scenario, this will happen. So imagine you are applying for your passport or you are paying your driving license fine, and as a citizen, you can dig into that law and you can find out why, it, why is it that I owe my French regional area 80 euros rather than the other French regional area in which I also speeded 60 euros. Who made that decision? And how can I change that decision come the election time? Now, digital enables us to, to provide a service which is fundamentally different in precisely that way. We can join up democratic debates with laws, with the delivery of public services. Why we're not uh, confuses me slightly, frankly. <laughs> um, but I, th I think it's because we've been approaching it in the, in the wrong way. And 
the adaptive change concept, by the way, is, is um, explained in a far more easy to understand and, and much more eloquent way than I can in a book called Leadership on the Line um, by uh, Heifetz and some other dude. Um, they're American. It's a great book. Um, so, so, so do read it. Um, but the, um, it, it, it's so heartening to hear how, uh, on a European level, the, the debate around user centricity appears to be won. The debate around government as a platform appears to be won. Yet let us not pretend that these are not without political choices. Right. Lego is a proprietary system. You can buy your government as a platform from Microsoft, I'm sure. And I'm sure if you take all of Microsoft's Lego bricks and put them together, you will have a brilliant Microsoft system. And if you want Microsoft to run your local area, maybe that's the right thing to do. But those are all ideological choices. Personally, in Hackney, we are working with s small digital agencies, most of whom work in Hackney. All of our intellectual property is open source. Everything's on GitHub. Everything's um, uh, shared on uh, G Suite. Um, but again, this is, these are ideological choices. <coughs> Where I live, 10 miles up the road, has outsourced the entire delivery of public services to a private company for the next 10 years. That is also an ideological tr choice affecting our ability to digitize. I think by making this political, by making it about adaptive change, we make this discussion far more interesting for the people we depend upon to make the important decisions to deliver this agenda. May, may I ask the innovation expert, Kitty? So, so, I mean, you mentioned this is bas basically, if I conflate all you said, we're, we're innovating legal frameworks, right? Because bureaucracy reflect legal frameworks. That is what's happening. You look down on what's the law, and then we operate. So if I may reflect that over to the, uh, the innovation perspective and the healthcare, which is one of the most you know, meticulously regulated areas because people die yeah, if you don't yeah. follow the law. Yeah. How can you even innovate in such an environment where everything is laws that are changed like every 50 years or maybe uh, every century? Yes, if we talk about the disruptive innovation, then uh, looking like uh, Uber or, or, or Taxify or whatever service, Airbnb, then uh, they first actually break the laws and yeah, exactly. then the laws uh, recreate themselves uh, under new conditions. And uh, if we take uh, healthcare, then of course, as you mentioned, the citizens' kind of uh, expectations have grown because if you use normally use uh, digital services which are uh, well designed, easy to use, you start to expect a similar experience from the public services and healthcare services. But uh, how to reach there is really a, a huge uh, question. Mm. In healthcare sector, it's one more kind of aspect which comes uh, to, uh, to my mind, um, adding to all other factors which you talk about, the governance uh, related issues, which is actually uh, the uh, evidence base, which means that uh, however your new uh, digital or whatever service uh, might be you have to prove, pr provide the proof uh, that it is uh, evidence-based. But if you kind of a start from a scratch, yeah. a new service, then uh, how, how you can get it proved? You probably need to get the service uh, clinically validated. Now the question is about the, like you mentioned in your policy brief, we need uh, uh, so it's development, testing, and rollout uh, environments. Yes. And do we have uh, them enough in healthcare? Probably not. And, uh, and that's the issue, actually, to create the evidence for a new services. And probably the new digital services cannot be assessed in the same way as we have used uh, in uh, assessing new uh, medi medicines mm. or, or uh, medical kind of devices. It needs a new kind of a way yeah. how we roll out the new services to healthcare. So, so that points to a very, I think, important element in this innovation uh, dynamics <laughs> that you need then uh, practices and you need uh, maybe also even government support for yeah. trying out new things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so I don't know, I mean, maybe what, what, what you were talking about with, with the SMEs. I mean, how do yeah. you even orchestrate this? So an SME said, we have a grand idea. Hmm. Th then what? There should be something where to put it, right? So yeah, I mean, I mean I'm just going, just you know, going back to the question really with a, with a few thoughts. I mean, what, one of the yeah. questions on there was, you know, who leads? I personally, 
it, it feels to me like it needs leadership at all levels, actually. Some right. services, for example, you can adopt a pan-Europe approach to. Some services, like the business support service I related to earlier, could be a national issue. You know, some things are a local issue. From a funding standpoint, um, yeah, f funding is a barrier, cer certainly within, within the UK. One thing we've done in Coventry and Warwickshire, um, you know, as this is an EU seminar, we have used ERDF funding, mm -hmm. partly mm -hmm. to enhance our broadband infrastructure in Coventry and Warwickshire, but also um, we've used ERDF funding as well to actually deliver non-financial support to SMEs as well as financial support to SMEs to, um, to give them better guidance and actual support on how better to utilise ICT and how better to, um, you know, to take up broadband infrastructure. That is public funding to address a key area of market failure. But the other point around innovation that you raised, Mar you know, Martin, um, partnership for me is absolutely key. And it's important for public sector bodies to work with the likes of broadband providers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also companies in, in the private sector on innovation. So one of the points I raised earlier around autonomous vehicles if government or local, that's local and national government, does not engage with the private sector, how, how, do, they, how do they know what's really possible? Right. And how do they know that they're therefore putting public finances into the art of the possible and not just wasting, you know, wasting, wasting public money? So that partnership working, I think, is, is absolutely key as well as the availability of public funding to pump prime. So, so a, a direct question or reflection, could that be then... Are you use are, are the well the the instruments the RDF uh, the the competitiveness the uh, innovation and, and research actions the instruments are they useful in this uh, I'm maybe I'm just across the board to, to, to hear which instruments are you using or what can you recommend uh, to to the, the the colleagues here and do they play together because that's of course one of the key things like the the the, the instruments that are available for the Commission side also tend to be focused mm. on uh, you know, different areas. But what you explain, I, I think unanimously, is the need for coordination among these yeah. initiatives. Uh, so that's really also a leadership role, you could say, on the European level. So I don't know if you could give concrete examples of, I mean, are you using the, uh, some of the, the instruments for, for citizen engagement, for, for the, uh, whether it's, it's uh, private or public, I mean, the, the commercial side, they're also stakeholders in, in the uh, 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 communities, right? So are the instruments uh, being used? The, the, the CEF, the Connecting Europe facilities, are you using in your tenders? I mean, I guess very few are up until now, but the vision is that this is going to happen. We will have something to put when you go to the open source community or to Microsoft or whoever. We can actually put some things in there. But how to get there? Can the instruments, uh, the, 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 the funding instruments, be used to that? Uh, and I opened the, the floor for, for the panel. Mm. I'll, I'll just talk about, you know, use of ERDF in Coventry yep. and Warwickshire. I mean, priority one, exclusively directed at research and innovation. It's, it's very much aimed at supporting um, SMEs um, to, you know, to develop new innovative products and technologies. And a lot of the SMEs we've supported in Coventry and Warwickshire so far, it is aimed at developing um, digital, digital products and technologies which, you know, service sectors such as health, also, the manufacturing right. sector. So, so may I just, just yeah, reflect, yeah. does that then challenge government? We heard about the examples of how the private sector can challenge. So do you, you go for that? I, I would, yeah, I, I would hope that some of the successes from the programme, uh -huh. that national government then understands what the successes are, understands the area of market failure that that programme is addressing, but also develops an understanding of areas of market failure that are not being addressed okay. and, and looks at how best to address them. Yeah. And also, you know, it comes back to the point, which areas does government need to address, which areas does the private sector need to invest, and actually which areas does government need to work with the, right. the private sector to address, address right. in partnership? Uh, Laurent, may I ask, in, in, in your s surveying this area, can you see, you know, some instruments standing out as... as you know, really excellent in, in, you know, funding some of this transition, bringing the stakeholders together, maybe locally, maybe across. So do, do any of the instruments sort of stand out or do you have any recommendations for maybe the ones sh shaping instruments or shaping on a national level the usage of those instruments? Any, anything stands out from your, your work there? I think in the particular survey we've done for, for the policy brief, uh, we didn't go into the detail of, of the specific instruments. Uh, 
but uh, but perhaps let me let me let me pick up one of the questions, if I may, that yeah. that was up on the on the screen earlier. I think it was linked to um, to whether digitalized public services mean job cuts in, in public administration. I think this is almost I think the elephant in the room. I think it yes. came up uh, also this morning. I think what's important to understand is that digitalization will result in the loss of some job functions and, and job roles because simply computers are better at completing certain tasks than, than, than humans are. Um, but, and, and these are not just low-skilled jobs, these are also jobs to, like accountants and doctors and, uh, and lawyers where you know, it's a lot of information processing and, and how, you, how you apply that. So uh, this is one of the, the main challenges that, that any organization faces and also particularly the, the public uh, sector. Um, what are the f to try to identify which, uh, which potential roles, which function might become obsolete. Um, according to, s to some studies, I think it's up to 40% of a function which, which become obsolete mm -hmm. in the next uh, 10, 10, 15 years. Um, and then it's really to, to understand, uh, well, what are the additional, what are the new roles that we will need within an organization? What are the particular skills that we need? What is the, uh, what is the skills base of my existing um, staff? Um, what do we need to do to perhaps reskill them to ensure that they, they can take on some of these new um, uh, digital skills to, to really harness the, the new way of delivering services um, digitally? Uh, one of the things that came out of the, the survey is also that an increasing number of cities are using uh, the data that comes from these digital services in decision-making processes, and this is really one of the keys to, to improve the service delivery, is to, to understand uh, how services are being delivered um, and how you, could, how you can optimize that. And in order to do that, you really need the capacity to essentially crunch the data. So, I mean, data in itself, I mean, the, we haven't, I think, talked so much about big data, but essentially big data is one of the keys to this. I mean, all these interactions generate, generate data. And one of the main challenges is to harness the, the insights from that data. So you need uh, to develop the right algorithms, you need to invest in, in, your, in, your, kind of in your data scientist uh, capacity in-house. So some roles uh, within the organizations will have those more, more uh, let, let's say, advanced, uh, um, uh, will need to have those advanced skills to really make the most of this, uh, this digital uh, tran transformation. And perhaps just to, 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 to finish off, I think this is also a challenge, really, that I think even as ESPON we have to take on. I mean, uh, at EGTC, we're quite a small organization, we're, we're 22. Um, but we are, we are both kind of transforming our own organization in terms of adopting digital tools to engage more, mm -hmm. more directly with, uh, with our stakeholders and our different target audiences. But we're also looking at ways in which uh, you know, big data and, and this digitalization can help us to, to deliver better evidence for, for policymaking. Yeah. And, and of course, the question is, where does that capacity get built up? Because that doesn't necessarily happen in every municipality around the world. I mean, there are, what, half a million local governments. I mean, you should certainly have capacity to work in this space, but the question is then, what are the actual job functions? I don't think, also what you're saying, we don't see exactly what they are and where they are. Okay, so may, may I ask uh, for, for, the, uh, for uh, the next <coughs> vote as we're going into the closing of this? Um, I think uh, one of the main objectives of this session is also to point to some action. So where do you go to, to solve uh, these things and what do you want uh, to do um, Next, I mean, okay, we have identified tons of problems, uh, but the question is then, um, how do we address them? So um, I invite you now to, to, to take a pick here. Um, what, what action should be taken to um, move forward in a, uh, let's say, a good manner? Uh, should we have uh, the practice led? I mean, show us the examples of what's working, knowing well that the best practice is still being shaped. Um, should we know about strategy? I think, in, again, that's best practice, but on a strategic level, maybe on a municipal level, regional. Um, so uh, initiatives that uh, can, can be had uh, and, and carried out, even if you don't have a big team, even if you don't have 22, but maybe you have half a person. So what can we do in that sense? Um, what about the European perspective? Uh, understanding more. Um, how can you utilize the instruments that are there? How can you influence so that get, they get even more targeted towards your needs? And uh, finally, um, I think that was actually the main concern here. How can we ensure that this focus on not the systems, but the life between the systems really get highlighted? So uh, I invite you now, and I can see 
uh, almost half of the ones that were there before have already cast their vote. So um, going into this, we are reaching top of the hour. I don't want to keep you uh, from the lunch. Maybe we can use this as a springboard for some uh, final reflections, if not conclusions, uh, from the panelists. And this goes as well uh, from um, uh, you, Jean-Francois, uh, when you hear the, the, the sound, I will have your reflections at the end of the colleagues here in the panel. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's in fact see, can we, any, any last votes before we show here? Uh, so we give a little bit of guidance to the, to the colleagues uh, up here. Okay, I think we can, we can show the, the results. <coughs> <coughs> ah, interesting. So um, good examples of strategy and good examples of practice. Um, and then what can Europe do? Well, that's something you want to find out by yourselves. Um, and initiatives on low resources. I don't know if that reflects that the people who are actually here are the ones who have invested more. So maybe you can reflect on, you know, how can we, how can we convey practical, where do you go to get practical, uh, best practice advice on strategy as well as implementation? So where do you get your, your inspiration? Where do you get your next steps from? Um, and uh, maybe some final conclusions on, on the whole discussion. You first match. Uh, so in my last job, I wrote our digital strategy for Buckinghamshire County Council, which you can find on the web uh, on a Saturday at my kitchen table. Um, and in my current job, we don't have a digital strategy. Why? Because Buckinghamshire was at the start of a journey and needed a specific way to inform the decisions we were going to make um, a, a, and a reference point to understand why we'd made those decisions. Whereas in Hackney, um, we have embedded the thinking about technology in the strategies and plans for each individual service. So we don't have a separate digital strategy. We have a strategy for place, um, and technology is enabling that. But any strategy which helps you decide what you're not going to do and doesn't make grand plans for what you're going to do much further than six months away is a sensible digital strategy. In terms of examples of good practices and, and innovations, I mean, I constantly look to Estonia, constantly look to uh, Singapore. There's some really interesting stuff going on in um, Boston, too. Um, personally, everything that I'm proud of, we talk about either on our blog um, or on my personal blog, okay. so you can find it all, and I'm happy to talk to anyone via social media about any specific examples. Mm -hmm. But we have two key principles <laughs> Um, that I was reflecting on when um, uh, we were talking earlier. One of our key principles is think big, act small. <laughs> and our second key principle is fail in a fortnight. If your answer is 10 million euros or more, then you're probably asking the wrong question. Thank you very much. Paul? Yeah, I mean, um, so some, some of the reflections um, from me. So. You know, key factors about implementing a strategy. Um, sort of ag agree wholeheartedly um, with what Matt's just said, and just just some views of mine. Um, have the will and the drive to transform, and the will to learn internationally. Um, develop effective public sector, pri public and private sector partnerships. Um, but also, I, I think um, certainly the message from Coventry and Warwickshire is. Um, you know, see digital, see digital infrastructure and access to data. See it, see it very much as the enabler, not just, not just the solution on its own in terms of you know, the enabler to regional economic growth, the enabler to better public services to meet consumer expectations. Those would be my reflections. Thank you. So, Kitty, some concrete yeah. reflections on best practice? What I have to say, uh, stay here or, or you're welcome back to get more um, hints about how Estonia has been uh, implemented the kind of a digital, I should say, not the digital strategy as a document, but the kind of a vision of digital society because it has been there for a long mm -hmm. and uh, taking the shape of different document, but documents, but it's still kind of a, a there and it's like a, a certain type of uh, belief in, in, in Estonia, the belief in digital society. We do have e 
uh, health strategies and, and all, all those documents, but I do agree with Matthew that uh, um, starting kind of a hands-on things and uh, going incrementally, uh, kind of improving and trying out things is more, more important here to move uh, uh, further in a, in a, in a better uh, pace. And uh, what about good practices and innovations? Then uh, stay tuned. We are just starting the Ipsum study. Uh, we study four regions uh, on e-health uh, and e-health services and the future of e-health. So uh, I'm very happy to come back and, and uh, discuss about the results and the, the lessons we learned. Thank you very much. So uh, Jean-Francois, are you there? You can... Okay, I guess you want me to intervene. Yes. So <laughs> I go in. Uh, so it works like that. Um, except I haven't heard the last, the last words. In terms of conclusion, what I would say that, um, first of all, we should all work together and we should use as much as possible the different knowledge and the different capacity of each of us to intervene. At European level, we have very little capacity to intervene at the local level, but at the same time, at the local level, you can benefit from what is happening at the EU level and anything in between. I think that's what I'm trying to say. But also, I would say to everybody is that uh, there are two key as aspects we should never forget. First of all, uh, it is not a matter to digitize procedure, digitize law. ICT technology enabled to rethink completely the way we are doing things and the role of the different actors. And maybe it is time to think, rethink that. As I said, often as a French person, I say very often we need to get out of the Napoleon model to rethink how administration should work and what their role should be. And the last thing that comes more from the English uh, and not the French language, we should not forget that we are civil servants. So we are all here to serve the citizens and we must make sure that what we do is for the citizens. It's not for us and it is not for the ICT developers. They need to also understand the way citizens think and what they want. Too often things are so complex, so difficult that nobody is able to use them effectively. Maybe they are forced to use it, so they will use it, but certainly they will not see great value from the public authorities. And we should not forget the private sector are doing things that is training the citizens and they expect the same from the public sector. That's the way I would have closed my speech. Thanks. Thank you very much. Laurent, may I ask you to, to, uh, to reflect on the same, but maybe be very specific also to how can the ESPON research uh, be used in guidance? Where can you, uh, I mean, in the coming months, in the, in the, in the coming phases of your work, <coughs> how can that be, you know, sources of exactly this best practice, especially on the strategic level? Mm -hmm. uh, I think on a strategic level, uh, if you look at the, the first question in terms of the key factors we need to implement a digital strategy, I think, I think, I think leadership is, is really key in any organization. I think. Uh, there has to be, the driver has, has to be there. I think so the realization has to be there that there's an, an urgency to act. So that's at the top level. But then also, um, I don't think it's necessarily about finding particular solutions, technical solutions to implement within your organizations as a priority. I think it's really about investing in, in your people. I think fundamentally we need to, uh, to, to get everyone in our public organizations to uh, to take on some digital skills. Uh, we need to invest in developing this capacity. And then it's just, uh, I think, learning by, by doing. I think it's, uh, in, in, the, in the previous panel, we heard <coughs> that, uh, I mean, one of the ways to develop trust and also to, to, to accelerate, if you like, the uptake of, of digital services to, is to let people use them. And I think then by they, it, it's learning by doing, and I think some of that skepticism uh, will then... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, will, will then will then wane. So I think in terms of also for Espon, I think you heard. Uh, so one of the the projects that we are kicking off next week is on is on e-health. Uh, so we will be looking more at uh, at how uh, digital is is impacting on on the transformation of different, <coughs> different services at different levels of, of government. We have other activities that will also start uh, next year. We'll be looking at uh, um, how big data can be used. Uh, to, uh, to promote development along, along growth corridors. That's a project that's uh, scheduled to start uh, uh, next year. 
Um, so clearly, I think we'll, we'll hope to contribute uh, to the debate, both in terms of insights on how um, public uh, sector organizations are, are transforming digitally, but also in terms of how we can produce evidence through new means, so harnessing big data um, and, and using that evidence for, for informing policy makings and, 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 and decision making processes. Very good. Not very surprising, but very, uh, let's say, uh, very, very um, promising that there are people actually putting much of this uh, research together in uh, snack bites so that you can go wherever you need it. All right, so we are coming to the uh, end of this session. Um, allow me to, to do a, a few uh, closing uh, reflections. Clearly, we're not there yet. I, I, s I heard the commission uh, colleague uh, mentioning, you know, when the transformation has been concluded or has been, I mean, I, I think probably one of the things that have, have come, come forward now is these different timelines. So we can expect this to really take a lot of time because people don't change, change that fast. Now, at the same time, uh, we also have to, to keep things simple. Um, so that we're not trying to, you know, while this is a, a, a huge issue, we're not trying to solve it all at once. And I think increasingly it's, I mean, you almost said, you know, uh, think global, act local. Uh, I mean, so we're back in what, the 70s when we're talking about climate. And it's, it's this uh, digitalization has this, you know, air about urgency. We'll be out of jobs. We will be, you know, eaten by technology or, you know, other people on this globe economically if we don't do something. But... There's no plan. I mean, because everything needs to happen in a concerted fashion. Um, I just just to give you a small anecdote to end on. Um, in Denmark, the environmental ministry began in the late 70s to have the first uh, plans and regulations around the reuse of plastic and circular economy, which came to be the whole wind power, green growth bonanza. And um, in the Danish Smart Cities Network, we had a session there comparing the two timelines. And uh, one of these <coughs> old, by now fairly uh, older guys, um, I put the question to him, OK, so Stieg, that's his name. If you look at the digital transformation, where are we compared to the, let's say, the, the climate, the, the, the green environmental agenda? back in 79 when you were a long, young lad in the ministry and you put in your first, like, whatever it's called, this pa scoping paper for the minister and so on. And he said, okay, we're not even there yet. I think that was a very, very sobering remark for someone who could see the similarities and, you know, the scope. This is a global, as, I mean, Paul, he outlined all the big dynamics going. It's global scope. It's about our, our global well-being, including the planet. And we're not there yet. So maybe something to think about when still, you know, it's failing a fortnight and, and we, we, there's this sense of urgency and we don't have any money. <gasps> that, is, that is among the key challenges, I think, that we're facing. Give a hand to the panel online and on stage. And thank you very much for joining. <laughs>